Right, so we are now moving um, from mid-ocean rich systems to island arc systems, and I will present you our newest results from a Brothers Volcano. So what is different between a typical mid-ocean rich system and an island arc? So at mid-ocean riches, when we're thinking about the metal sources, we usually leach them from the host rocks. On the other hand, another extreme, if we are looking to active continental margins, we have interaction of meteoric water with host rocks, but we also know that we have a contribution of metals by magmatic volatiles. And there we typically find epithermal and porphyry deposits important for gold, copper, and silver. When we're now looking at back arcs and island arcs, they're probably somewhere in between. So obviously we also have seawater or leaching of the host rocks by seawater, but we may also have variable contributions of magmatic volatiles, and that's one of the main questions today. So how important are they and how much influence do they have on the composition of, on our seafloor massive sulfide ores? And now when we are looking on um, island arc and back arc systems, so one of the reasons why they may get interesting for mining is they have high grades of metals such as copper, gold, and silver. However, the downside may be that when we compare them, for example, with Atlantis II or with TAC, most of them are just far smaller than, than the mid-ocean rich systems. But still, they have quite high grades, so if they get interesting, what we need to understand is really why do we have those high grades, They're what controls them. So when we are thinking about what metals do in the crust, then, well, everything first of all starts with a magma, and then after a certain time, our magma use usually reaches some sulfide saturation. So what we will form are immiscible sulfide liquids, which can be preserved in the host rocks then as the sulfide globules. And these are basically our phases where we usually leach our metals from at mid-ocean ridges. And if we want to compare it with a fossil system, this would be like a typical cypress-type volcanic hosted massive sulfide deposit. On the other end, when we have magma degassing, as for example in mature arcs, then we can get something like that. Here's an active example from um, Java. And um, we have high sulfidation epithermal porphyry systems. And if those two affect our submarine island arc systems, then they probably should somewhere in between. And well, to test this, we need to understand um, what the interaction is between the magmatic and hydrothermal system, and I think this is in particular something we don't know a lot about until now. And then a step further, thinking about what these source parameters um, do really with respect to the metal, metal budget of our seafloor uh, massive sulfide ores. So when we have a look now on our case study side, here's New Zealand, then we have here the Kermadec arc, and up there the Tonga arc, and just north of New Zealand is Brothers Volcano. To the west, we have the Hafred Trough and the Lao Basin with the Valufar Ridge back arc systems. Further to the west, it's the Colville Ridge, the Remnant Arc. Up there, for your orientation, we have Fiji. We have a closer look now on Brothers. You see here a bathymetric map. All these arc volcanoes here typically show a caldera and quite often a younger volcanic cone complex. We have altogether five identified hydrothermal active sites at Brothers, which is the Western Caldera, Northwestern Caldera, and the Southeastern Caldera, and two active sites associated with the volcanic cone, the upper cone and the lower cone hydrothermal systems. Samples we studied are from the Northwestern Caldera and from both sites at the cone, shown by these little red lines, which are the dredge locations of our samples. Now we have a first look into the petrography of our samples. So what we can clearly see here that the sulfide segregation must have been multi-stage or continuous. And we can see this that these tiny sulfide globules occur associated with different silicate or iron titanium oxide minerals. They occur in plagioclase, they occur together with clinopyroxene, but most commonly um, together with iron titanium oxides as inclusions, but they also use the iron titanium oxides as nucleation sites. So they post-date them. Then another feature, I hope you can see that here, we have here a vesicle in the lavas. And along these vesicle margins, we also see sulfide precipitates, which are in composition mainly pyrite, but rarely we also find cubanite, so iron titanium sulfide. And we look now on the lava chemistry with a focus on metals. We see here copper, 
Molly against Silica. Um, symbology stays the same throughout the talk, so I added data from Pool Ridge, which is in the Manos Basin. Rumble 3 and 4 and Les Perrons are arc volcanoes from the same segment of the <coughs> Permadec arc as Brothers. Is all this data is glass data except those two indicated by the WR for um, whole rock. And what we can see here is that the behavior of copper and moly is distinct. So Brothers is very poor in copper here, but in contrast, moly is really, really high. So one of the questions is really what fractionates them. So there must be something, there must be a process which fractionates those two metals. So we have seen that there are magmatic sulfides. So one possibility, the easiest way would be, okay, they partition into the sulfides and copper does that more strongly, as we can see by that partition coefficient compared to moly. So which means, in other words, the amount of moly we extract from the melt into the sulfides it's probably not enough to change its behavior from, a, from an incompatible one to a compatible one. So if this is true for copper, then when we have a look now on the magmatic sulfide chemistry, then we should obviously find copper-rich sulfides, what we do. So we see here in this triangular plot of nickel, copper, and iron. Um, symbology in red, data from the Brothers Cone. In blue, data from the caldera. In the background, the gray lines is data from magmatic sulfides from mid-ocean ridges. First of all, we see they are poor in nickel compared to the mid-ocean ridges. We have many analyzes near stoichiometric pyrotide, and then we see we get cubanite. So we get copper-rich phases, but interestingly, at least, we don't find chalcopyrite, which is still quite common at mid-ocean ridges. And, well, another point maybe worth mentioning is that we don't see a difference between those from the caldera and the cone, so they are identical um, in composition. So, in other words, this could possibly work for copper. Another test now would be, as I mentioned before, the question is what effect could magmatic volatiles have? So if we have a look now again on the distribution coefficients between volatile phase and silicate melt, we see, well, copper is also much more compatible in there than moly is. So basically, we could also explain it possibly by um, the release of magmatic volatiles. So the next step now is to test and to find out whether there is significance for that. And for this purpose, we um, analyzed melt inclusion. So you can see here sulfur and chlorine against silica. Symbology is the same as before, <coughs> but we added now melt inclusion data. So open symbols are melt inclusion, solid symbols is the glass data, for example. Here, the red open circles are melt inclusions for the Brothers Cone um, data. And what we can see here is that the melt inclusions are higher in sulfur than the glass data. So this may suggest that we have degassing of sulfur. We also calculated then here the sulfur concentration at sulfur saturation, um, which, well, it works, so we see that um, we reach sulfate saturation. However, we also noticed that the melt inclusions in particular are above that curve, which is weird, which should not happen. Um, so the only explanation we have at the moment for this is that there may be tiny sulfites in our melt inclusions that we probably analyzed because we couldn't see them. So we used an electron beam of 10 microns in diameter. So this could be the reason for that. And another evidence for degassing is then this petrographic feature I showed you before. So the occurrence of sulfides along vesicle margins, which have been previously suggested for other location as a sign of sulfur degassing contribution of that sulfur to the, um, towards the hydrosomal system and later on. And when we look down on chlorine, we see there are like two distinct trends. One would be like a normal incompatible behavior during fractionation. Then we also see that we have variations in chlorine at a given silica content. Also, higher chlorine in the melt inclusions compared to the glass data. So this means there may also be a chlorine loss by a volatile phase. When we have now a look on copper, I added here data from Cornel de Ronde, and the melt inclusion data also shows higher copper contents than um, our glass analysis. So we also may have a copper loss there during magma degassing. And then the next point for us was, if this works for sulfur, chlorine, and copper, well, what does water really do? So if we reach um, saturation in a melt um, for degassing, then water must do the same thing. So we did a couple of thermodynamic calculations. So we calculated the water saturation limit. We used isobaric conditions. 
um, temperature range we suggest is representative for the Brothers melts in that compositional range. And the water saturation limit we got is basically in that gray box here. So we are looking at somewhere at around 3.5 weight percent of water. Then we used um, plagioclase melt hydrothermometry, and the results you can see in those gray squares. And the water contents we got there basically overlap with the water saturation here. And then the lines you see in here are calculations by the MELTS modeling software used on our major relevant data. So we have two independent methods and they both overlap with that um, water saturation limit. So this suggests that our MELTS reached water saturation. Petrographic evidence for that is the occurrence of vapor bubbles in MELT inclusions, which are common. So that's really um, no rare feature. So in other words, we also could have like a volatile contribution here and a release of magmatic volatiles from the melt together with um, sulfide liquid segregation, which fract fractionates, fractionates copper and moly from our melt. So finally, if this is true, we thought, well, the copper moly ratio could maybe then be a good tracer for those processes. So what we did then is we thought, okay, let's compare it with, high, with data from high sulfidation epithermal porphyry systems on land where we basically know that there is usually a magmatic contribution by volatiles. So you see here the copper moly ratio against copper. And in the background now I added here um, least altered host rock data from these high sulfidation systems. First thing, that's what we would expect. It overlaps with our submarine data. When we now add bulk or data from these high sulfidation systems, which is shown here in that white field where we suggest, okay, we have a contribution by degassing. It plots up here. And now if this works for our submarine systems, we should again see an overlap. And indeed, we do. So for brothers, for example, the white circles, we see them here, and they have higher copper and a higher copper moly ratio than the host rock data. And the same applies to the Valufarich and to Pacmanus, which is a hydrothermal field at um, Pool Ridge in the Manus Basin. So we believe that that combined process of leaching and contribution by a magmatic volatile phase can explain <coughs> the high copper contents we find in the SMS or from Brothers, which, are, which reach almost 36 um, weight percent. And then we have here um, sulfur isotope data from the Ronde from seafloor sulfides, and they also suggested that this sulfur is of um, magmatic origin by degassing. So finally, to conclude, so yeah, we see that we have two copper sources, really. One is leaching, as we see it also on mid-ocean ridges, and the other one is likely uh, magma degassing, as we know it from um, high sulfidation system. And this suggests that Brothers is like a hybrid-type system between, let's say, Cypress-type volcanic hosted massive sulfide systems and high sulfidation systems. To work that out, the copper moly ratio seems to, que seems to be quite useful. And importantly, this is really nothing local. So we see that brothers, we could extend it to some back arcs. And similarly, it has been shown for Milos and Colombo. So these are processes we probably have to consider on a broader range from a global sense. That's it. Thank you. Any questions for Manuel? Thanks, Manuel. Very interesting talk. Um, have you considered the effects of CO2 degassing? Because, of course, the CO2 saturation is much it, higher pressure. It, it could be a half an effect, but yeah, we just don't have any CO2 data. That's the point. So. Um, and I didn't have a look on the, into the fluid data from the seafloor, so I would have to do that. I can't, I can't tell you, to be honest, but that would be basically the thing to have a look on. Yeah. 